everyone. Welcome back to another week of the Bulletproof Hygiene Podcast. This week, we will be talking about radiographic calculus and how that is such a thing of, uh, it's terrible and it's beautiful and exciting when we see it pop up on those x-rays because we know that most likely we'll get to scale it off and that's always exciting. We don't like it because of the, um, you know, locally ir irritational factors that it causes our patients gums um, and all of the, the plaque lasagna that tends to sit on top of it. But we have some thoughts about radiographic calculus um, having to do with uh, treatment planning and what role it, it does in reality actually play and how we treat and plan uh, hygiene procedures. And the what I think gets in the way of us treatment planning the, the proper hygiene procedures. So um, I wanna start by saying that the most common objection that, that I've heard in my career, and Teresa, you can share, you know, whatever yours is, if it's similar or different, um, to doing scaling and root planning, the most common objection that I've heard from doctors and hygienists alike is, um, but there's no radiographic calculus. And I honestly just want to like scream when someone says that to me, because we know that calculus is a local irritant. It's what enables plaque biofilm, AKA the active part of the periodontal infection to adhere to something subgingively. But there are so many reasons why this statement is flawed. What are your, what are your thoughts? Has this been your experience too, Sharisa? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I'm even, you know, in early in my career, I kind of felt the same way. I'd look at, I'm like, wow, oh, I don't really see much, you know, maybe we maybe just get away with a profi today, but I am seeing the inflammation. I am seeing the redness and the bleeding, you know, obviously there's something going on, but I think we have to take a step back. And what you just said is exactly what we're doing. We're not, you know, calculus is an avenue obviously for bacterial to attach. And, you know, it is an irritant for sure. Mm -hmm. I talked to my patients. I explain it kind of like a barnacle on the bottom of a boat where it's just really rough and it, you know, it creates a lot of area for bacteria to live and thrive on, but that's not the only thing we're going after when we're going subgingively. It is that bacteria, you know, it is that microflora that's down there trying to disrupt that. And those toxins and those, you know, the inflammatory markers, all of that attaches to the root structure. It attaches and embeds itself in the tissues. So it's not just about the calculus. Right. Yeah. The systemic comorbidities of periodontal disease don't come from the calculus. You know, the calculus is, is that local factor. It's that calcified plaque. It's not the living part of the infection. So I think it's important to keep that perspective and remember that. So today um, we're going to kind of review what the decodes that we use every single day actually mean, like what the actual definitions are and also how we can implement them effectively, like what effective treatment planning looks like, what the most appropriate um, codes for each patient are, you know, what those are for each patient um, and what, you know, what diagnostic factors we should be considering all the time having to do with formulating a the most adequate and the most accurate hygiene treatment plan and diagnosis, you know, the co-diagnosis that we, that we have. So again, you know, I can't tell you how many times both from doctors and hygienists, I've seen them pull up bite wing x-rays and say, Oh, it looks pretty good. Are we doing a profi? And I just want to point out like something that is obvious that I think we have forgotten or we just need to look at again and be reminded of. And that is that, you know, bite wing x-rays, there are so many limitations. Um, so you, what we can see on a bite wing, obviously, is the highest point of interdental alveolar bone. So the highest point, either the buccal or the lingual. We're not going to see the lowest point, right? right? We can also see moderate to heavy interproximal subgingival calculus. We cannot see mild to moderate, especially if it's, if it's on that mesial or distal concavity on the root surface. Like that's not going to show up on a bite wing x-ray. So some of the limitations of bite wing x-rays are we can't see those buccal or lingual bone levels. We can't see buccal or lingual subgingival calculus we can't see light to moderate interproximal subgingival calculus. We can't see the lowest point of interdental alveolar bone or PDL attachment. We can't see whether periodontal disease is active or arrested. And sometimes large tori um, superimposed on the alveolar bone can create this false radiographic bone height. So those are just some limitations. So I, I wanna step back and review kind of radiography 101. And this isn't meant to be at all like insulting to any providers out there. Like we, we all like, I think need to review periodically of all of this stuff. We review like radiography things, we review proper probing, we review 
decodes about once a year at Spodak. And it's not because these, these are things that we don't know. It's things that we know and have learned as clinicians, but we don't talk to the patients about every single day. So sometimes it's easy to lose like all the small details and the fine print of all of these things and forget and just start practicing according to what patients are perceiving in our own anecdotal experiences, you know? So a bite wing or a, peri or, or a PA x-ray is a 2D image of a 3D object, right? So we, we don't take CBCTs to determine the presence of subgingival calculus because dental hygienists spend at least two years learning to detect subgingival calculus with an explorer, right? So in school, so each surface and line angle is checked by an instructor to determine if we identified the correct surfaces with subgingival calculus to begin with, right? Before we remove it. And then they're checked again. Every surface is checked again by a hygiene instructor after hygiene was performed to assure removal of subgingival calculus using not radiographs, but an explorer. And I just, I just want to interject here and say too, that when, when we take clinical boards as dental hygienists, radiographic calculus is not a prerequisite. And what we do during our boards is scale. I don't remember if it's one or two quadrants, but we do scaling, we do scaling and root planning. We do not need radiographic calculus to do scaling and root planning. My board's patient did not have radiographic calculus. I passed the boards, you know? So these are all important things to remember and consider. So, you know, I think it's important. Let's step back and look again at the diagnostic information that we actually need to consider before making a determination about what hygiene procedures are appropriate for each patient. So we need to look at radiographs. Obviously that's a piece of the puzzle. We need to look at the comprehensive perio charting and let's just for a minute consider the difference between a bite wing x-ray and a comp perio chart, okay? Because there've been so many times, like I said before, that I, I have heard I'm sure I've even said earlier on in my career, like, oh yeah, the bite wings look okay. Eh, I think I'll just, I think I'm going to do a profi. And for me, I remember earlier on it being more like, I didn't realize the value that I was bringing to the patient. So I was afraid of the high cost of treatment. And I always, I always wanted to, I was, I was afraid of upsetting the patients by telling them they, they needed to pay out of pocket. I didn't know how to have those conversations. So I was like, oh, I'm scared to tell you like whatever it is, you know, which of course, as we know now, like that's not ethical. That's not fair to the patient. When we can't make those decisions for them, we have to fully inform them and let them make decisions for themselves. But I remember that was one of my hangups earlier on in my career. Now it's definitely not. Now I'm like, I, you know, I have this ethical obligation to tell you all this information. If you don't like me as a result, that, that stinks, but it is what it is. And we, we can accept now, I think a little easier that every patient isn't for our practice. Like that's one thing, but also like patients do have options, you know, as long as it doesn't involve supervised neglect, as long as they choose a treatment avenue, a treatment option, you know, that's, they have the autonomy and the freedom to do that, you know? Um, so we need to consider radiographs and comp perio charting. The comp perio charting is that circumferential diagnostic tool. It's not a CBCT, but what do we measure? We, me we take six measurements around each tooth. That's buccal, lingual, interproximal into the call, right? So we have that circumferential information we couple it with radiographs, we couple it with the clinical um, intraoral exam and the medical history and whatever other components there are involved in that, you know, decision-making process. And a lot of times, you know, when we look at the decodes for hygiene procedures, I think that it, it'll boil down to sometimes our clinical experience because a patient may seem in between one or two things, or it may not be always cut and dry and obvious. So we've got to resort to our clinical decision-making skills too, based on the most recent evidence, the gold standard of care based on our experience, based on collaborating with other professionals or our interspecialty um, experiences. So we've got to consider all of these things, not just glance at the bite wings to make a determination about perio health or disease. Right. And I think when we're doing the comprehensive perio charting, um, there's two other things that I want to mention that I think are really, really important. And sometimes we get uncomfortable because patients will say, ow, that's uncomfortable, ow, that hurts. There's a reason for that. And that actually, we need to acknowledge that that's part of the inflammatory and infection part is there is active inflammation and infective and it is uncomfortable because that tissue is irritated and it's sick. Right. So sometimes we kind of want to skip over that and feel like, oh, they're saying I'm a bad clinician. And you know, we have had those patients that are like, well, you're stabbing my gums, of course right. it hurts, we've right. all heard that. 
but you know, it's, it's us stepping back and saying, well, did you notice that it wasn't uncomfortable every single tooth? It was only uncomfortable when you heard me kind of saying those deeper numbers. And that's because there is active infection. So I think we have to, that's part of the assessment is, is there pain? Is there discomfort? And then secondly, and I think this is so, so huge is bleeding, the presence of bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that is the, no pun intended, but red flag signal that this is an active process going on right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like, I know that we've all got like similes and um, different things that we like to express these things or explain these things to patients with, but I like to say, like, if you wash your hands, it doesn't hurt, you know, but if you wash your hands and there's a cut there, that means there's a problem. Like it could hurt, you know, you're just washing your hands. That's a very normal, like action. It should not hurt if there is no problem, you know, and, and the same thing with probing. And especially when a patient either goes from health to disease or disease to health, it's our job to kind of like point that out and stop taking it so personally. You know, we, we know as clinicians that whether or not we're doing everything to the best of our abilities. And also, you know, it's okay for that patient. Um, if we, of course, you want to take the very best care of them, make them as comfortable as possible while also calling to their attention. Like that's actually a sign that things aren't great. Yes, we can still use or kicks or cetacane or whatever. We can still make them more comfortable. Of course, we want them to be comfortable in our chair. We want them to communicate if they're not comfortable, you know, because it isn't about us. It's about taking the very best care of them and providing the best, the best care, you know? Um, I so I think it's okay to point out what you just said and be like, well, that's because there's disease, you know, I'm really sorry that it's uncomfortable. I can actually use this numbing gel to, while I continue, or I can do this to make you more comfortable, but I'm just letting you know that that's actually a sign that there's disease there. Right. And it's a really great way to, to build trust in you, in yourself as a clinician on the flip side, after you've done treatment and you're reassessing and you're, you know, doing your period charting again. And the, I've had multiple patients say, did you do, you did that again? Like that didn't hurt at all. I'm like, yep, that's exactly how it should feel. So that, that keys them into, oh my gosh, I really did have a problem. The work I did paid off. The yeah. investment I made paid off. Now things feel better. Okay. I get it. Yeah. And then they're, they're kind of, you know, those patients for life because they know that you're going to do what's in their best interest and you're going to mm -hmm. help keep them there. Yeah. That's great self-validation. And it was great validation for the patient that they made a good choice. You know, they chose the right thing. So this um, excerpt about dental calculus is from uh, an article by Becky Despain Eden. It's called Prevention Strategies for Periodontal Diseases. Um, and it says, dental calculus known commonly as tartar is mineralized dental plaque. Calculus occurs in most people, but the extent varies widely among individuals and populations. Oral self-care, frequency of dental care, age, systemic health, diet, and ethnicity affect the formation of calculus. Calculus is a contributing factor to periodontal disease due to the retention of dental plaque on its rough surface. So notice how it says it's a contributing factor. It's not the only factor or the, the primary factor. So now I think it's time to get back to the basics, review some treatment definitions, um, and then go forward from there. So uh, Charisse and I both love the D4346 code. Um, it's the gingivitis debridement code. It has been really, really helpful um, for using for our, our gingivitis patients, our moderate to, or, you know, moderate to um, heavy, what am I thinking of? Moderate to severe gingival inflammation patients um, when there is no attachment loss. If I'm honest, there aren't many patients who I feel are actually candidates for this procedure just because I don't often see no attachment loss in the presence of moderate to um, severe gingival inflammation. A lot of times I'll see mild attachment loss or, you know, even if it's localized or something, there's some attachment loss a lot of the time, not all the time. Um, but it's a code that I'm really happy now exists. Um, I do use it. I know Teresa, you love using this as well. It's just, it, I use it a lot less than I use the scaling codes. Right. Well, and I think I, you know, at, at the beginning, when anytime a new code comes out, you're kind of unsure, all right, how do we use this? What are the, what are the stipulations on this? You know, how do we classify this? And I'm very careful to, um, you know, really use, utilize both assessments between the perio charting and the x-rays because for your D4346, there can be no bone loss. Right. You can see, you know, radiographically. So, you know, I'll do my perio charting and I'll look back again at my bite wings just to kind of look through interproximally everywhere and say, okay, yes, this is truly just a gingival issue. It does not involve, um, 
you know, bone loss. And then if I, you know, obviously see bone loss, then that may be more of a limited type of scaling root planing, you know, the right. 4342. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So the actual definition of 4346, it's called scaling in the presence of inflammation, as we all know, um, but it's the removal of plaque calculus and stains from super, supra gingival and subgingival tooth surfaces when there is generalized moderate or severe gingival inflammation in the absence of periodontitis. So indications, therapeutic procedure for patients who have swollen, inflamed gingival, moderate to severe bleeding on probing and generalized super bony pockets, but who have no bone loss. So generalized, just so that we remember and have a reminder, is more than 30% of the mouth. So localized is less than 30%. So as long as this is occurring, in greater than 30% of the mouth, we can use this code as long as there's no attachment loss. Right. Um, so the next thing is periodontal maintenance. So periodontal maintenance, I learned uh, that you can actually do very localized scaling using the periodontal maintenance code if the patient has had historic scaling, replaning, or periotherapy, right? So I didn't know that before. It's something that I learned um, a few years ago. So for a person who has had non-surgical periotherapy one or more times, and they have this localized area of where they have a five millimeter pocket, they have probing, you know, oftentimes we'll do a period of maintenance. And then honestly, I'll bring them back for a four to six week reabal to make sure this isn't like a, a chronic active disease. It's nothing that's, that's spreading to the rest of the mouth. It's not something that needs retreatment. You know, we can just do that localized scaling. It's a part of the code. So the definition of the code is um, for patients who have been previously treated for periodontal disease, the definition uh, says it includes the removal of bacterial plaque and calculus from supragingival and subgingival regions, site-specific scaling and root planing where indicated, and a polishing of teeth. So what I will say is when we go to the prophy definition, like prophy ideally is happening with a person with zero attachment loss and definitely, definitely no active disease. The no active disease is the most important component of that. I know that sometimes patients come to our practice in, uh, in a non-ideal state, meaning they have historic attachment loss, but no active infection, no active probing, you know, localized or no active bleeding, you know, really no active infection. And if they've never had historic scaling and root planing, it, it could mean a couple of different things. Obviously we weren't there. It could mean that their perio, when it was active, someone maybe didn't tell them that it was active, didn't treat their active disease, or just did a, a bloody prophy and basically did free scaling for the patient. And now their disease is arrested. It could be because it's secondary to occlusal disease and it's currently not actively changing, right? So sometimes I have done a prophy and I think that it's appropriate to do a quote unquote prophy if there's a history of attachment loss when there's no active disease, only because I've, I've tried to have this really difficult conversation with patients of like, hey, we're maintaining an arrested disease state. I think that we should call this a perio maintenance. We're maintaining arrested disease, right? Um, but that has been really difficult to truly implement um, because insurance makes it very, very difficult. And although we don't treatment plan according to which, what insurance dictates, I think that the absence of active disease makes it one of those things that's I think could go a couple different ways. Like for my fee for service patients, I would call that a perio maintenance. Like if they come in and they are fee for service and they have a reduced periodontia, no active disease, I will call it a perio maintenance. Right. If but if it's an insurance patient, I will likely call it a prophy. What what is your take on that? Or what is your thought about that? So it's funny that we're talking about this because I just had a patient, a new patient on Friday who um I would. So when I looked at her, we do an insurance breakdown before they come in mm -hmm. and she had history of perio maintenance. Like her last visit was perio maintenance. But when I did all the assessments, things looked really healthy. There was no bleeding there. Were, you know, there was no pocketing. There was no active infection. Um, so yeah, I kind of in my head was like, hmm. And we ended up just doing a prophy because I literally didn't have anywhere to get up underneath and, and manage. So yeah, I agree with you. I think there's times when you just have to look at the situation and determine what's truly happening right now. And then, you know, I know in my head that if for some reason life changes and things flare up, then we can have that conversation and, and do the appropriate. And have treatment and then incorporate yes. maintenance moving yes. forward. Yeah. So I, I'm totally on the same page. This is one of those instances when I think that our clinical licenses and our clinical decision-making comes into play 
But I think it's important to note that if we're doing atrophy or peri maintenance, there's really no active disease except for the example that we just gave with a very, very localized active disease after perio has been treated, after it's been treated with non-surgical periotherapy or surgical periotherapy. Um, you know, if it is not, then we're looking at treatment, right? So if a person is a prophy and everything has been healthy thus far, and then they have localized disease activity, then we're in a different boat, right? right? Because they haven't, they're not a perio maintenance. They're not right. in that boat yet. They haven't been diagnosed with active disease. Now they're in an active disease state that we've got to diagnose and treat and then move them to perio maintenance. Right. And I want to speak to that for just a second, because I feel like sometimes we try to own too much. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is we'll see a patient, we'll do all our diagnostics, we'll educate them. They'll say, yes, they'll move forward. They'll have the perio therapy. We'll do the best job we can. You know, we'll instruct them on the home care regimen. We'll see them in the, you know, for return visit to evaluate. And, you know, we can see them for, you know, a couple months up to a year and feel like we're maintaining. And then all of a sudden we might notice, you know, inflammation is, is back, bleeding is back, you know, we're, we're back into an active infection and it starts to feel uncomfortable because we've kind of owned, oh, well, I'm the one who's managing all this. And we have to step out of that and say, well, I can't control. There's so many things for the patients that we cannot control Right. Um, so that's not on us, but I feel like sometimes there's that fear to say, well, I know you went through all this treatment with me and we worked really hard, but there's still infection. Yeah. That's okay. And the best way to manage it at that point is, Hey, we did everything we've known to do. Um, you know, now maybe it's time to get somebody else involved. And that's when we want to make that, that referral out. But I know that sometimes that feels uncomfortable. Like we did everything we could do and it wasn't enough. And I don't want the patient to think that I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I think that's just, we got to free ourselves up from that and know that we have the specialist out there to help that patient be their healthiest selves. We, we are so limited when we are doing non-surgical, right? So we do the best we can and then we got to refer out. Yeah. And that's a very me filter, like transitional thing that I think a lot of clinicians go through. You know, I think it's important. One of the things that I've learned or has become the, one of the most important things for me is from the beginning, telling the patient all the factors that we know contribute to their active disease state. So, you know, home care does contribute to it. Is it the only factor? No, definitely not by, by no means. You know, what we do are, you know, what we do clinically, is it a factor? Yes, absolutely. Is it the only factor? No, by no means. They have genetics, they have uh, immune, immune health issues, they have stress, they have local factors, you know, old dentistry, um, even like weird obscure things like an enamel pearl or like a root defect or something, you know, all these things contribute to active disease. So we can't take responsibility for a person's active disease state. Our responsibility is to educate them and inform them of what is going on with their health currently. So that we've got to remember that whether that involves referring to a specialist after we've done everything that we can um, non-surgically or not, whether it can just be maintained non-surgically with us. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really important thing to, to remember too, is it's not about me. It's not about you. The patient may be upset. They may not be happy about that, you know, but we still have an obligation to tell them. It's kind of like if an oncologist treated their cancer patient a certain way and it didn't kill the cancer. Okay. What are we going to try next? They wouldn't just give up and say, one, they wouldn't not tell the patient Two, They wouldn't give up and say, well, we tried one thing. I guess we're just going to throw in the towel. Good luck. You know, like they would keep fighting and trying different avenues and realizing that there are many factors involved in this cancer process, not just one, not, you know, just this one treatment didn't help. Okay. Let's try something else. It's well, very I accepted and normalized in other areas of medicine. And we've got to kind of accept it and normalize it in the area of dentistry too. Right. Yeah. I just saw a patient again on Friday who I've been seeing for a long time. Um, she had her second baby. And ever since then, she's like, my gums just they don't feel right. They're bleeding. They're uncomfortable. And we got her in period trays and she came in and she's like, Oh my gosh, they feel so much better. I'm not bleeding. But when I got in there to, to evaluate and the evaluation, there was definitely improvement. But when I started getting things cleaned up, there's still a lot of bleeding. So we had the conversation. We're not doing the peri periodontist stop yet, because I think this might be, my gut says it's more systemic. Mm -hmm. So she is, she left, she's like, I'm going to call my OBGYN, OBGYN right now. Cause we had the conversation of, you know, her hormones could still be way out of whack. I did do an, um, extra oral, oral cancer screening. Her thyroid felt a little larger. And I'm like, you know, have you had thyroid levels, levels checked? And she hasn't. So she's like, 
I'm going to go back. They've been talking to me for a while about potentially doing an IUD to help control the hormones. I want to talk about that. And I want to get my thyroid levels checked. So we're going to start there, but I think it's just being able to kind of step away and think of the bigger picture because you're right. And I think so many patients feel that shame and blame because they feel like it's just a home care thing. Yeah. And I like to build that into my patients and say, look, I can tell that your home care is great Yeah. because you don't have a lot of buildup. You don't, you know, the tissues do look pink and firm. It's when I'm getting down into those base of those pockets that I'm getting the bleeding. You're not getting the bleeding because you can't reach them. Right. So this is not a shame and blame on your part that you're not doing enough. It's just, I can't control that you're asthmatic and using an inhaler and you have dry mouth. I can't control that, you know, you're having an issue with stress and not sleeping well. And so your immune system isn't strong. Like there's just so many things. So sometimes I think just having those very real conversations with the patients makes them more at ease too, and realizes, okay, this isn't me doing a bad job. There's just more than we can handle. So let's figure out how to do it. Right. And in that instance, you informed the patient of what was still going on and and that's basically providing an opportunity for that patient to investigate what could be a systemic issue. Right. Like otherwise she might, she might never investigate it if right. there wasn't that oral condition. And like, yeah, like the string and the, the brushing. And we know that that makes it about two millimeters subgingively. Like there are such limitations to that. Even if a person has an arrested four or five millimeter pocket, it's likely to not stay arrested. You know, that's why we do maintain them every three months because it's an ideal situation for anaerobes and facultative anaerobes to kind of take over that area. So it's just something to keep in mind. I think that taking the pressure off of ourselves and off of the patient's home care and just realizing this is such a complex and multifactorial thing, like that we just have to continue informing the patient, continue being honest with them and letting them make informed decisions. You know, I think that's the most important thing. Um, in regards to perio maintenance, just going back to the perio maintenance, and we just reviewed the definition, but I think some clinical things to look for and to remember are that uh, probing depths generally are going to be one to three millimeters, right? With maybe localized four to five millimeters. Like we said, it could be that very localized scaling um, uh, situation. And in that case, I would see them back um, in four to six weeks for reevaluation, make sure that this isn't something that's getting worse. Um, there might be like a, a localized light BOP or no BOP. There might be arrested or inactive disease state, uh, recessions, vacations, mobility may be present, but not actively changing. Um, and most of these perio maintenance patients have received official non-surgical or surgical periotherapies. Like I said, there are those instances where I think someone just did a bloody prophy or someone did free scaling and the person, you know, the clinical evidence speaks to the fact that they had active disease at one point in time. Um, and we're going to get into the um, topic of occlusal disease too, because I know that some people are thinking, yeah, but occlusal disease and what, you know, factor could that play in the attachment loss? So we're going to cover that too in a second here. So just hang on. Um, but I do want to go into a couple of the other uh, definitions here. So let's talk about the definitions of scaling and root planing, the D4341 and D4342. So the definition is a therapeutic procedure involving instrumentation of the crown and root surfaces of the teeth designed to remove plaque and calculus, as well as remove cementum and dentin that is rough and or permeated by calculus or contaminated with toxins or microorganisms, right? So active perio disease. So that bleeding, that radiographic, sometimes not radiographic attachment loss. There could be facial and lingual attachment loss, right? We won't see that on the radiograph. So we've got to remember that. Um, that's one of those things that's, that's where providers get stuck sometimes is they're like, yeah, but I don't see it on the bite wings. Like, and usually we overlook, or we tend to compare, you know, mild disease to the worst we've ever seen. So we might be overlooking the flattened lamina dura and just saying, oh, there's no attachment loss yet. Yeah, yeah, there is. That's mild attachment loss. You know, we might be seeing it on an x-ray and just kind of ignoring it because we've seen so much worse, you know, or we forget that there is a mild bracket, there's a moderate bracket, there's a severe bracket, there's a from here to here for each one of those sections, you know, for each one of those definitions. So we can't just say like, oh, this mild is exactly like that mild, or this moderate case is exactly like that moderate case. There are, there's, there's this um, from, what am I trying to say? There's like a, there's a span for each one of those things. You know, it's not just like one size fits all. We've got to remember what the true definitions are for this, you know? Well, and I want to speak into this for just a second, because I feel like I have a little bit of an advantage um, in our practice where I do utilize a microscope. So, you know, it's so interesting to look at a, look at an x-ray and not see any kind of calculus on the x-ray 
but you take that plaque out from the pocket and look at it and look at all those fire keats and rods just go into town. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's one of those, like, we can't see what we can't see. So yeah, we, we cannot rely on just what, what is looking at us radiographically. Yeah. The determining factor. Absolutely. Yeah. So I like to, so I have the advantage of working with periodontists yes. at my office because we're multi-specialty. So that's always also a really cool thing because I feel like I've learned a lot from them, you know, like getting to talk to them, getting to see what their treatment plans are for certain scenarios and situations. So what I've learned and, and what I typically do is if I think that a patient's health or disease state can be managed by just non-surgical therapy, then I will likely start with, with this, right? I will likely start with non-surgical paratherapy. If I think that there's, if that's questionable, then usually what I'll do is refer them to a specialist first. And the best slash worst case scenario is the specialist refers them back to me for scaling. Right. But I love, I love being wrong in that sense, because then the patient doesn't need invasive treatment and the patient just needs scaling roof, you know? So it's like, I mean, I never want to waste a specialist's time by referring when the patient doesn't need specialized treatment, but there are also these windows and certain cases and avenues. There's only like a window of time and clinical opportunities for things like LANAP. Like for instance, if I do non-surgical periotherapy on a patient with uh, vertical bone defects with class two or three furcations with probing depths of six or higher and lots of clinical inflammation. If I do scaling on that person, it's that to me sounds like a person who should have had laser. And I've now killed their opportunity to have laser treatment, which could have regenerated some of that bone. And now the person is in, is in a worse long-term, you know, long-term prognosis kind of state than before I did therapy for them because they can't maintain those class two and class three purcations. You know, if we could have regenerated bone in that situation, that would have been ideal. And the laser only identifies hyper inflamed, like that really red, angry, um, uh, what's the, what is the word? Um, the red, angry inflamed tissue. I know I'm thinking like cyanotic, but I know that's like blue edematous? and kind of more acute. Yeah, ed yeah, edematous, thank you. Tissue, that's what the laser recognizes to be able to start the process of reaching down to the bone and and, causing that regeneration. So we've got to use like clinical judgment and be careful that if a person should see a specialist first, realize that and refer them first, you know? So I like to plan scaling for mild to moderate periodontist cases, according to ADA case types, um, localized or generalized probing depths of five millimeters or more true clinical attachment, you know, uh, with bleeding on probing, Plaque, calculus, endotoxin, staining, other accretions may be detectable with an explorer. Um, I, like I said, once we get into that class two, class three furcation range, I consider sending them to a periodontist because especially with those maxillary teeth, we have one of our doctors says that once we reach class two furcation, like obviously gingiva is covering that, but the patient can ma can't maintain it really with anything that they have, right? So especially with maxillary teeth and the porosity of the bone up there, what tends to happen subgingivally is that tends to unzip and it can quickly become a class three or even a class four for cation. Then the tooth is basically hopeless or has a very poor prognosis long-term, you know? So as soon as we start getting into those advanced for cation situations, or if someone has complex occlusal issue or something that I just feel like this is beyond me, like there's no shame in that. Like I'm ready. I'm all about referring them it is not, you know, about me or Sharisa or the provider at the end of the day, it's about doing special patient. So I'm okay with giving them the quote unquote bad news that we can't do a, a cleaning for them today, or we can't do hygiene. And I explain to them why, right. especially if I suspect that it could be a laser because most of those patients have like gross, super gingival, uh, or even if it's not gross, even if it's light, mild to moderate, you know, super gingival accumulations of calculus and plaque, they're like, oh, I just want my teeth clean. Can you just clean super gingivally? Well, no, I can't because then the top of the tissue will get healthy. The laser won't, won't be able to work as effectively or at all because it can't get past that. It can't now move past it. It doesn't recognize any inflammation happening. It won't do anything for you. Right. So, so that's an ideal situation to use a laser. But even if, you know, if a person comes to me for the first time and they have um, more localized or even kind of an arrested disease state or five millimeter probing depths without bleeding those class two or three furcations, I might, I might refer them to traditional perio to see if osseous or pocket reduction surgery is the best long-term solution for them. And again, you know, the worst and best case scenario is they're referred back to me for maintenance or treatment, you know? Well, and I think part of that is 
knowing your periodontist well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm pretty jealous because you guys are under one roof. So you can just go down the hall and talk to them. You can right. in and say, Hey, what's happening? What are you guys doing today? Um, I I've learned a lot about, you know, the specialty aspect from you because you do have that review. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm actually planning, um, I love our periodontists that we work with. I'm actually planning to see if I can go hang out with them for a day mm -hmm. and just kind of watch and see what they're doing and understand that better. Because I think the more we understand what's happening when we refer them out, the better we can communicate with our patients about what, what they can expect and what that's going to look like. Um, I think it makes the patients feel better to know that we are in, in good standing and good communication with the specialist. Like we're going to take care of you collaboratively, which is right. also awesome. Um, but I think, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, well, you know, I'm going to refer them out and not know what's happening, then, you know, get in with your periodontist, you know, ask, Hey, can I come in and observe for a day? Could you come in and do, you know, just kind of a, a meeting with our hygiene team and talk about what you're doing? Cause I think it's just really important to have that collaborative, you know, treatment for our patients. Yeah. And I would guess that, that, that there's nothing that would make a specialist happier, to be honest. Like I, ca I can't imagine them being upset that you're like, Hey, can I go learn more about what you're doing so that I can refer more patients basically to you, you know, because the better we do understand the, the more accurate our referrals can be, we're referring the right candidates and the right patients more often, you know, so that creates less frustration for the patients and, and less frustration for the, the specialist and the best case scenario. Um, and also like we talked to a bloody tooth guy, you know, not long ago, and he was talking about that interspecialty collaboration and communication, like what better a way to set up like communication lines than to directly meet with the specialist and say, Hey, I want to understand what you're doing. And I want to let you know what I'm doing on my end. And how can we collaborate better? Like that patients are going to see the full circle of that. Even if you don't have the benefit of that specialist coming to your side, you know what I mean? And meeting the patient face-to-face -face on, on the same day that they're seeing you. I know that that's a huge advantage that I have and it's uncommon to have that, but I think that there are ways to, I think that's a great idea. I, I think that you could only win. Things could only be better for the patient by doing that. So I want to talk about the second most common objection I hear. And I think Sharice will probably agree with this by dentists and hygienists, um, for not doing non-surgical periotherapy is, well, I know they have attachment loss and probing with bleeding, but it's because they have occlusal disease. Can't you see they have occlusal disease? So the first thing I wanna say about that is that, well, I'm, I'm gonna read some research here, um, but the first thing I wanna say is, when did those two things become mutually exclusive? When did periodontal disease and occlusal disease become mutually exclusive or who determined that? because there's no such thing. Like I've met so many patients who have both. So why wouldn't we treat both problems if they're both present, you know? Okay. So the, so the person maybe has period disease that has been exacerbated by their occlusal disease, right? Okay, great. There's still period disease and there's still occlusal disease. Let's treat both of the problems. Why would we just treat the occlusal disease and ignore the perio? The perio is like a cavity. It's not going to get better without treatment. It's not naturally going to heal itself. It's not going to like if it was, we would tell all our patients to do oral pulling, like, yeah, just go heal your own, heal your own cavities and heal your own perio disease. It doesn't work like that. And we know that. So I just wonder like when that misperception started. And I remember there was, there was a hygienist that we had, and I did not take responsibility for hiring this hygienist. She is long gone. Um, I was not involved in the hiring process, but I remember she, she worked at a perio office actually before she came and worked at Spodak for a very brief window of time. And I remember one thing she said to me was, yeah. So when the patient has horizontal bone loss, it's because they have occlusal disease. They don't have perio. They have occlusal disease. Just blanket statement across the board. I was like, what are you, what are you thinking? Like that is a nonsensical statement that makes absolutely no sense, but she was like adamant about it. You know, and it just, it makes absolutely no sense, but I want to, I want to read um, this article or part of this article by um, Stephen Harrell, who's a dentist um, written in 2016 and it's on a website called Decisions in Dentistry from the Journal of Multidisciplinary Care. Uh, we can attach the link to this uh, podcast. I'm sure we can do that. Um, if you want to read the whole article, I'm just going to read a chunk of the article because I think it's great. It gives an overview of longitudinal and historical research and randomized control trials regarding the uh, effects of occlusal disease on perio disease and the correlation between the two. So... Um, it says an examination of data that supports an association between certain types of occlusal contacts and progression of pocket probing depths. So the role that occlusion plays in the, prog in the progression of periodontal disease has long been controversial. 
Early clinical observations indicated that teeth with heavy occlusal loads seem to have deeper pockets than teeth with normal occlusal loads. In the early 20th century, Stillman postulated that abnormal occlusal contacts were responsible for periodontal disease and that successful periodontal treatment was centered on occlusal adjustment. The mid 20th century, many studies of cadaver material attempted to demonstrate one way or the other whether occlusion played a role in the progression of periodontal disease. Glickman and Smulo believed that heavy occlusal contacts or occlusal trauma in the presence of gingival inflammation were a co-destructive force that resulted in deep pockets and bone loss. In comparison, Werehog uh, argued that all periodontal destruction was associated with solely, solely with the advancing subgingival plaque front. Extensive animal studies also tried to correlate various forms of occlusal trauma to periodontal disease progression. The anatomical differences between animals and humans, however, and the types of trauma that were applied to animals make it difficult to, to correlate the results of these animal studies to human periodontal disease progression. The 1996 World Workshop in Periodontics summed up the occlusal research of the 20th century by concluding that there was no proof occlusion played a role in the progression of periodontal disease. It also noted that with the exception of the treatment of mobility and presence of parafunctional habits, there was no proof that occlusal treatment was beneficial to the control or treatment of periodontal disease. In addition, the workshop recognized that developing an ethical research protocol to determine a definitive answer to the role of occlusion and human periodontal disease progression was impossible. A controlled clinical trial would involve diagnosing periodontal disease and occlusal discrepancies and withholding treatment from a portion of the study population. So obviously that would be unethical, right? So we assess and we find that there's disease and then we don't treat it. Um, and there's really no way to have a placebo in this instance, right? So we can't use a placebo. It's either you're treating it or you're not kind of thing. So I could see what the ethical dilemma is there. So this next section is called occlusal interference. So given the unequivocal statement of the World Workshop in Periodontics, in periodontics that a controlled cl clinical trial evaluating the role of occlusion and periodontal disease progression in humans was unethical, an effort was made to retrospectively determine the effect of occlusion on the progression and treatment of periodontal conditions. Patient records from a private practice were evaluated to determine if occlusal discrepancies were a risk factor for the progression of periodontal disease. These studies were based on assessments of patients who have received periodontal evaluations, including thorough occlu occlusal assessments. Patients then chose whether they wanted to receive complete periodontal treatment or only undergo a portion of the recommended therapy. The patients voluntarily returned in 12 months for another periodontal and occlusal examination. So there's a figure here, there's a graph, and it says this graph depicts the deepening of pocket probing depths in patients who did not receive periodontal therapy for at least 12 months following their initial evaluation. As would be expected in untreated periodontal disease, teeth with or without occlusal discrepancies develop deeper pocket probing depths over time, but teeth with occlusal discrepancies developed deeper pockets more rapidly. Data were correlated using the general estimating equation to compensate for varying follow-up periods among subjects. So it goes on to say some patients diagnosed with periodontal disease decided not to complete recommended periodontal treatment. When they returned 12 months later, the progression of periodontal involvement in teeth with occlusal discrepancies was compared with the progression in teeth that did not have occlusal discrepancies. This allowed for the ethical evaluation of the effects of occlusal discrepancies on untreated periodontal disease. In addition, in cases in which patients had some treatment before dropping out of active therapy, the effect of occlusal adjustment on teeth with discrepancies could be evaluated. Among patients who had no periodontal treatment for 12 months or longer, pocket probing depths continued deepening over time for teeth with or without occlusal discrepancies. This is expected as it is well established that untreated periodontal disease worsens over time. The rate of increase in pocket probing depths for teeth with occlusal discrepancies, however, was significantly higher than the increase in pocket probing depths of teeth without occlusal discrepancies. This portion of the study offers clear evidence that presence of an occlusal discrepancy resulted in a more rapid increase in pocket probing depth and that presence of an occlusal discrepancy negatively influenced periodontal health. So um, due to the evidence suggesting a possible association between occlusal discrepancies and the progression of periodontal disease, it is advisable for clinical teams to evaluate and record evidence of occlusal stress in patients with periodontal disease. Signs of occlusal stress include parafunctional habits such as grinding and clenching, which may occur as a result of skeletal or positional misalignment of the dentition. A prominent clinical feature of parafunctional habits is the presence, as we know, of flat spots or wear facets on the teeth. Obvious wear facets with a shiny surface usually indicate the patient is presently bruxing, 
While those of the dull surface suggest the patient has been a Bruxer in the past, but is not currently, or perhaps Bruxes intermittently. In either case, the findings should be recorded and the possibility of clenching or grinding discussed with the patient. Many individuals who routinely clench their teeth are not aware of this habit. And the first step is educating these patients to show them the wear of patterns of the wear patterns on their teeth. If patients are unsure or deny that they are Bruxers, they should be presented with information that will help them self-diagnose possible parafunctional habits. So signs of parafunctional habits include waking up in the middle of the night or morning with teeth clamped together, waking with muscles of the face and jaws, feeling tired or having tired teeth in the morning as if the individual has been chewing gum all night or waking with a tenderness or pain in the front of the ear. Any of these signs is an indication that the patient is grinding or clenching during sleep and that intervention is indicated. So the summary of all of this, and I've, I've just kind of grouped some of the most important like aspects of this very long article, right? So you can go back and read the whole thing if you click the link um, that, that we'll provide. But the summary is the role of occlusion in the progression of periodontal disease remains controversial. While not definitive due to the inability to perform an ethical controlled clinical trial, current data seem to indicate that occlusal discrepancies and current types of occlusal contacts contribute to the pro progression of periodontal disease and that treatment of, occlu of occlusal discrepancies has a beneficial therapeutic effect. As a result, occlusal evaluation and treatment, if indicated, should be an integral part of periodontal therapy. So of course, if we read something from Invisalign or research from certain companies, all of it's, all of it's biased anyway, right? Anytime humans are involved, there's some level of bias. I don't wanna go with stats from Invisalign because of course Invisalign wants us to enroll Invisalign, right? So I don't wanna go with those stats. I don't wanna go with um, people who have conflicts of interest or any you know, parties that have conflicts of interest that they um, readily acknowledge. You know? So this is very, I thought a very concise overview of the treatment from the 20th century and 21st century on occlusal disease and periodontitis and the correlation. So it still seems a little bit hairy, you know, but my own anecdotal experience, and I'm sure your own anecdotal experience tells you that there is definitely a correlation. So my personal anecdotal observation when it comes to occlusal disease in patients is that many times a patient will have occlusal disease, then as months and years go by, they have an increase in probing depths with BOP. So when a patient is losing attachment, I think it's important to remember that the anaerobes or facultative anaerobes can only live where there is little or no oxygen. So as the pockets get deeper, it creates this more ideal area and situation for the anaerobes to thrive, right? So deep, dark pockets where maybe there weren't overwhelming the patient's immune system before, but now they are because they've been given an opportunity. It's important to like remember, okay, this may have originated with occlusal disease, but it has developed into periodontitis and now it needs treatment. Right. And I think I've seen, I've had a couple of patients where, um, I'm seeing, you know, it's interesting and maybe I know you said you just took a summary of that article, but it was interesting that they didn't talk about a sign being a recession or a fraction as well, because obviously that's a big one too. Yeah. Um, I think there, there was, there was a portion. I think I just left it out because it was just getting so long. I didn't want to continue, yeah, sure. but there, I think there's a part on that. So I have a patient who um, I've seen for years and he, it was interesting because he had some, some pocket depths, four or five millimeter pocket depths, but his tissues were pink and firm and healthy and there was no bleeding and there was generalized horizontal bone loss. And I was like, God, you know, I, I think that this is just occlusal disease, but we now have this really wonderful technology. Let's just do some salivary testing and know for sure, like what's going on. And his test came back. He is the only patient that came back with absolutely nothing detected on the test. We actually did it a second time just because we were like, what's going on here? And it also came back with nothing on it whatsoever. So he was one of those, you know, lucky guys. We're like, hey, right now this is just an occlusal disease thing, right. but here's what you need to know. When you're walking around with this pocketing, this bone loss from the occlusal disease, that creates that environment for those anaerobic bacteria to set up camp. So even though it is not active infection right now, we want to see you on a more frequent interval. I want to see you every three months to make sure that the, you know, that this is not becoming a problem. And obviously we got him, he was not open to doing orthodontics, but we got him into a night guard. He was, you know, definitely a big bruxer. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes he's compliant and sometimes he's not, but um, when I see him, you know, it's really, really important to make sure that there is no bleeding and, and no inflammation because we know how susceptible he is. Right. Right. And that's, that is awesome. Honestly, I think that's great to hear. And this is a great example of the fact that 
you know, there are a lot of patients who have both occlusal disease and perio disease, but sometimes they just have one or the other. Like this is when our, you know, clinician hats and our licenses and all our education come into play because you made a clinical determination. I think that's really cool that you did salivary testing and it was like, no, nothing. Okay, great. Now we just ruled that out. You don't have active perio. We don't have to treat this right now with non-surgical periotherapy, but we do have to try and prevent that from, from occurring. And we do have to try and maintain and keep a closer eye on you because you might be now higher risk than you were if you did not have occlusal disease or if, you, or if you weren't showing signs of attachment loss secondary to occlusal disease. Right. Well, and I think, you know, talking about the tools of the trade and things that are really helpful. I know we've talked on past podcasts that you and I both love getting to use the iTero scanner because it does have that occlusal map. So it's a, such a great way to educate the patient and let them see for themselves oh my gosh, this recession, this abfraction correlates with that really red area on the occlusal gram. Mm -hmm. I get it. It makes sense. It's really hard, you know, for patients to get it and understand how it all fits together. So for me, you know, we talked about how we all have our own ways of kind of explaining. I always talk about a fence post planted very firmly in the ground mm -hmm. with the, you know, the dirt tied up around it. And if we come to the top of that post and we bang down on it, or we push really hard and, you know, move it around, what happens to the dirt around that post? It starts to loosen it. It starts to dissipate. It starts to ebb away and dissolve away. And our teeth are similar. They sit in that bone. So if we're hitting that, you know, with, with these occlusal forces that it, they weren't meant to take, that bone starts to dissipate. And so when we have that bone loss happen. Now we have these deeper pockets. Now we have this place for these bacteria to collect if the patient can't reach with their blood, toothbrush and floss. So I think when we can explain it like that in a real world way, I see the light bulb go, up, go off for a lot of patients and they're like, oh yes, this makes sense. And they're much more open to doing what the treatment is to get their occlusion into a healthy situation. Right. And then I love that you're coming like from the health standpoint and not from the aesthetic standpoint, because anytime right. we talk about ortho, you know, especially our, our quote unquote older, this isn't really older, but not, you know, someone who's a teenager or in their twenties who we typically think of, or who patients typically think of when they think of orthodontics, like who, who right. has orthodontics or who doesn't, or who should or shouldn't get it. Um, like I've noticed that for my patients in their forties or fifties or older, when I talk to them about it from a health standpoint like that, they're more likely to accept treatment because they're thinking they're health minded now. You know, a lot of them, their um, their barriers are like, oh well, I don't need to look. Like, I don't care. I'm I'm married, or who do I have to show off for? Or what you know? Why does my teeth don't matter to me? I don't I don't care how they look. And it's not about that. Like I always explain that you know the aesthetic outcome is just a a side effect. You know of the of the ortho treatment of moving the teeth into a healthier and more functional position, and that the functional effects are what we're aiming for and what we're going for and that are, are, are the important aspects. So that's also important, I think, for when that patient does go home and talk to their spouse or their significant other about our recommendations. Because if, if it's an aesthetic issue, I think that the spouses secondarily, especially since they weren't there, are less likely to support the patient's enrollment in ortho because they're like, oh, your teeth look fine. There's nothing like what's, you know, you can live with your teeth like that, or, or I think you look beautiful or like whatever it is, you know, which are all nice things, but that's not what we're doing it for. Right. Yeah. No, you I, know? and, you know, kind of taking it back to the radiographic calculus aspect. One thing I do want to make sure I make the point of is I think it's really smart for us as clinicians. You know, we get excited when we see that radiographic calculus, you're like, Oh, this, this hope if it's not too tenacious, this might be a really fun one. Right. Um, but I find not everybody does this and I just think it's smart and I think we should do it is we should always go back and take a follow-up x-ray after we've done our therapy to make sure that we have removed everything that was there. Mm -hmm. I think that, so I want to say a couple of things about that. So we did learn in hygiene school to detect calculus subjunctively with an explorer. So I think it's important to use and remember that we have learned how to do that and that we are equipped to do that. And also that if we don't see calculus on the post-operative radiograph, doesn't mean we removed all the calculus, just like a bite wing didn't indicate that, you know, there wasn't calculus there to begin with because we couldn't see it radiographically. So that's something that is important to remember, I think. Honestly, for me, I think the reason why it is important to take post-operative bite wings when there's radiographic calculus is to show is to be able to determine like okay was this 
just left behind after scaling or is it actually new accumulation? I think it's good clinical documentation of that. Like, okay, there, there wasn't anything at least radiographically that we could see after the scaling and root planing, but now there is. So clearly it's new deposit. So that may impact or affect how we um, schedule that patient for recare, the frequency, you know, and we can prove like, yes, it, you know, we couldn't see anything there before and now it's here again. So there is something that's going on. You know what I mean? I have a patient who, you know, once a year, we almost do scaling and root planning once a year, you know, because she has, she actually has radiographic calculus that is new. Like, and she comes on three month perio maintenance, like interval. Sometimes she, she, you know, she falls off here and there though. So I think it's like, it just really makes a big difference for her if she maintains that. And also she's been recommended perio protect and, and has refused that um, due to tooth sensitivity. And we've discussed, you know, the options of using the Periprotect with the Perio gel and the uh, Prevenant gel for desensitizing purposes. And she's completely like, doesn't want to do it, doesn't want anything to do with that. So that is, a, that would be an ideal tool for her. And I've explained that and presented it, right. um, but she doesn't want to. So that's a person who like, yeah, I mean, we take pre and post bite wings and we basically do the scaling once a year. And when I see her, you know, I'm like, okay, we're due for bite wings today. We may have to rescale depending on what we find, you know? So I think that it's important with all of the information that we have to remember, we are always at the end of the day, making a clinical determination as to what's going to be best for this patient with them, with our doctors, right? Depending on all of the information, not just one piece of the puzzle, not just the bite wing, not just whether or not there's radiographic calculus. And then the, the thing that I want to leave everyone with, and that we want to leave everyone with is that we remember a couple of things. So anything we do in hygiene is going to be minimally invasive when it's compared to surgical options that patients will need if we allow their periodontal disease to progress to moderate or advanced stages. So that's one thing, right? So I know that we did the aggressive versus conservative treatment planning episode um, about, you know, quote unquote aggressive and quote unquote conservative and how to treatment plan appropriately instead of using those labels, right? So it's important to remember that when we're treating early disease, it's because there's actual disease present and it's not aggressive. It's about treatment planning appropriately by identifying and treating, by identifying early disease processes and not allowing it to become more advanced, AKA more expensive and invasive treatment basically. Right. Any final, any final thoughts on this? Um, I wish everyone had a microscope because I feel like when you can really see what's going on, um, from a bacterial standpoint, man, it gives you the heebie-jeebies and you realize that there's a lot of stuff we don't know, a lot of stuff we can't see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, a lot of stuff we can't manage when, when we see that. Yeah. Um, but hopefully we'll progress to the point where, you know, maybe that is the future where we'll be able to use for all of us to utilize that. But just knowing what I know, I just think, you know, use all of the assessments because they all tell a story. It's like this beautiful puzzle that you put together and all those pieces add up to tell you exactly what's going on from your medical history to their previous dental history, to their, all their lifestyle factors that are going on to the, you know, the bite wings, to the pano, to the perio charting, it all fits together um, to, to really help guide us, to help guide our patients to be their healthiest selves. Yes, and you know what doesn't fit with any of that is the cost of treatment or their insurance coverage. I was going to say, or what insurance dictates, because right. yeah, that's that is definitely not a factor that's going to help anybody. Absolutely. So I think that if honestly, my thought about this episode is, if there's one episode that anyone listens to, I hope it's this one, because for me in my career, this has been one of the most um, interesting and sometimes frustrating ongoing topics of conversation and uh, areas that clinicians kind of disagree about most. So I think it's important to get calibrated again, to remind ourselves of the actual definitions, um, to go back and review um, the AAP, perio case types, you know, staging and grading and, and make sure that we're up to date in regards to all of that. And that we just remember that we are prevention specialists and we provide the least invasive care. So that's just the thoughts that I want to leave everyone with. So we hope that you guys have a wonderful week um, doing what's very, very best for your patients. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. We hope that you have a great week and we will see you soon. And I just want to say that if you guys are loving what, what uh, you're hearing from us, we would love for you to leave a review about our podcast and uh, just let us know what you're thinking and what you want to hear more of. And 
what, um, what your thoughts are. Everybody have a wonderful week and we will see you next week.